I, I love these sort of community outreach engagements. Um, I regularly speak to hearing loss associations in the area. And on my end, I mean, part of the reason I enjoy this so much is because, you know, I, I feel like sometimes I have the best job in the world. As, you know, as was mentioned, I'm both a scientist and a clinician. So my view, I, I get to say, well, I get to study things that I find absolutely fascinating, and then I get to help people in the process. So what I'm going to share with you today is some of the things that we've been doing you know, here at Stanford in order to help people with hearing loss. Um, and uh, frankly, it just to answer some questions that people commonly have. When these are sorts of things, the questions people have when they come into my clinic every day, or when I talk to people in the community and people have questions about hearing, what sorts of things do I see most frequently or hear most frequently? Okay. So before I do any of that stuff, we'll give you some very basic stuff. Okay. And let's just talk a little bit about how we hear in the first place, okay? So this is a very brief anatomy overview for all of you. It kind of sets up everything we do later. Your ear and your hearing mechanism consist of three basic parts. We have the external ear, which is, you know, what we think of when we think of your ear, your pinna, and then your ear canal right here. So sound will come in. So as I'm talking to you right now, I am creating pressure waves that go, and these sounds, these pressure waves will go down your ear canal and are going to vibrate your eardrum, okay? And this eardrum is the barrier that separates your external ear from your middle ear. Now your middle ear space, this is where the bones inside your middle ear are housed. And the purpose of these bones are to transmit sounds basically from your external ear to the inner ear or the cochlea, okay? So sound will come in, it's gonna vibrate the eardrum, it's going to set these bones of the middle ear into motion, and that's going to transmit sound or transmit the, the energy then into the cochlea. If you have a hearing problem that's because of a blockage here, a problem with the external ear, or a problem within the middle ear space, these are things we can fix medically. And here at Stanford, we do this all the time through surgeries, through, through certain types of medication. These are medical fixes. What about hearing loss that happens here? Hearing loss that happens in the inner ear, that's the most pervasive form of hearing loss that people experience. And I'm gonna spend mo my time today talking about the consequences of hearing loss here. Okay, so if we go from this little part right here, this cochlea, and kind of image out, this actually is like little tiny chambers that are inside your bone back here, okay? Inside this temporal bone right here. And so there are three little chambers right here so you have your scale of vestibuli and your scale of tympani, and these are basically just filled with a water-like substance. But inside this middle one, the scale of media, that's where all the cells for hearing take place. Okay, it's where everything exists. And when we think of hearing, most of what we think of is action going on in through here. So let's, um, now one very cool thing about your ear is your ear all the way up to your brain is basically like a big piano, okay? And by that I mean it separates sounds according to different pitches or different frequencies. So like we like to say it's a frequency analyzer. And by that I mean if you take that, that um, back up one step, if we take this, I unroll this whole thing like here. I unroll this whole snail shell. We come back to this right here. So now we've got the outside part of the cochlea or what we'll call the base. And we travel on up into it through into the apex, into the deepest part of the cochlea. And what you can see is that the deepest part of the cochlea corresponds to low pitches. And as we go further out through the cochlea, we go to higher and higher pitches. So our ear, basically, depending upon what pitch is coming in, is going to respond in different ways. Okay. So this is how we can help to separate one pitch from another pitch. So how do you separate like beep from beep? There's different parts inside your ear that are being stimulated as you do that. Now, if we go into the very, kind of like very closely at these cells right here, and let's zoom even closer, there's a lot going on in the, in the, within your inner ear, but there's really four parts that I want you guys to care about, and four parts that are really going to matter for most of your day-to-day -day life. So we've got things called the outer hair cells, and we have the inner hair cells, okay? We have a little jelly-like substance called the tectoral membrane. That'll probably be the last time I say that word. And we have a little phrase right here called the ba a little, um, little piece of tissue here we call the basilar membrane. And that'll probably be the last time I say that word today, too. 
But let's talk a little more about these outer hair cells and these inner hair cells because these are what really are necessary for you to hear effectively. Okay, so here we're zooming again a little deeper. So what we have, we have three rows of outer hair cells and we have one row of inner hair cells. And the great things about these cells is they serve very different purposes, okay? These outer hair cells actually help to amplify sound. One of the cool things about your ear, it's completely different from your eye. It's much more anatomically complex because your ear, when it is working properly, will actually produce energy. And frankly, that's what makes it so hard sometimes with hearing aids or cochlear implants or other devices because when we try to restore hearing, we have to account for the fact that your ear is producing energy. So these cells will actually move back and forth. They will elongate and contract in response to sound when they're working properly. And that's what helps you to hear these very, very, very soft sounds. These inner hair cells basically have most of the nerve fibers that connect to the brain. So basically, these amplify sounds so we can hear very soft sounds. And these then transmit information to the brain. Okay? When you lose your hearing, in most cases, most of the time what we're talking about are these cells dying off first. So when you people say, you know, I have trouble hearing soft sounds now. Well, maybe I can hear things a little bit, but I have trouble in some background noise. It's almost invariably because these things are starting to die off. Okay? And I'll show you the, the exception to that in a couple minutes. Okay. So what happens to these cells when you start to lose your hearing? Okay. So this is, this is an electron micrograph of like what these cells look like inside the inner ear. Okay. So we've got three rows here of these outer hair cells. You can see they've got this nice little V shape right here. These little things right here are actually on the top. We call them stereocilia. What they really are like little hair bundles that sit on top. So these guys are actually, they have like very organized. It's like having a good hair day when you have normal hearing, okay? So we've got three rows of these like this, and they, they got a little shape like this. And then the inner hair cells, it's almost like having a little mohawk kind of sitting right up top there. And again, these are very carefully organized. What happens if you get too much loud sound? Or what happens if you get certain antibiotics that cause you to lose your hearing, okay? Well, the game changes, okay? So imagine here we've got these gorgeous pictures of kind of nice looking, perfectly looking outer hair cells, and this is a normal ear. So if we have loud noise damage, we suddenly go from having a good hair day to a bad hair day, okay? And that's the first thing that happens, is these things, these stereocilia get displaced all over the place, and then eventually these cells are going to swell up and explode. And when they explode, they're not coming back yet, okay? So this is what, and then eventually scar tissue builds up. So this sort of scenario happens with excessive noise exposure, happens as we get older, okay? General, happens with certain forms of genetic deafness where these cells basically just do not function anymore, okay? So that, when that happens and you say, well, gosh, I'm having some trouble hearing, then you end up coming to see a guy like me, okay? And every day, my team of audiologists, we're looking at, at we test hearing. You know, that's, that's a big part, that's one part of what we do. We do a lot of things. But one of the core things that we do is we test hearing. Now, how many of you guys have had a hearing test before? Ah. <laughs> I'm dealing with a, <laughs> I should have guessed. <laughs> so all of you, like, so all of you have seen an audiogram before, basically. So just a reminder, so again, this is set up, again, just like a piano. Remember how I said your ear is set up by different pitches? And we set this up the same way. So we got low notes or low pitches on this side coming across to high notes or high pitches. And up at the top, we've got very soft sounds. And we come down to extremely loud sounds. And with those of us in the hearing community, what we do is we don't talk about things in terms of percentage of hearing loss. I think every audiologist I know cringes when somebody says, I have a 50% loss. Because it's like, well, 50% of what? You can have, in this case, this person has perfectly normal hearing in the low pitches and they have a severe loss in the high pitches. So that's not a 50% loss. In this case, this might be like a, oops, oops let's go back. This might be an 80% loss, for example, and this might be a 5% loss. So percentage of hearing loss doesn't really mean much to, to those of us kind of, and we, we talk about it in terms of what's your hearing like at different pitches. 
So I'd say this person has normal hearing sloping to a severe loss, okay? And when we fit hearing aids, when we look at any sort of treatment, this is how we think about it, okay? Now, I'm talking to you here about how, you know, what your hearing is actually like, okay? And this is the sorts of things we see every day. But that's not necessarily always what drives people in the clinic. And what makes people come in and see somebody like me? And one of the first things is, why do I have trouble understanding speech and background noise? How many of you have trouble understanding speech and noise? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a pretty common thing. And that's what drives most people into the clinic first. So here's phrases that people say to me all the time. Um, you know, um, I can hear when people are talking. I just can't always understand what they're saying to me. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah. yeah. You know, I can do OK if I'm just sitting talking to you one on one. But you put me in a restaurant, I have problems. Does that sound familiar? You know, I do OK until you get me into a meeting. You know, if they got a couple people in my office, I'm OK. And you put 10 people around a table, and then I break down. So, you know, these are the things that happen over and over and over again. So when you lose your hearing, what I'm going to show you guys now is it's not just, you know, when you lose your hearing, you don't just lose your ability to hear. There are other things that influence your ability to function in background noise. And I think sometimes that gets lost because we get so caught up in like, you know, what's your hearing part like? Because the hearing part we can fix. Some of this stuff is a little trickier. So let's go into this a little bit. Okay. Actually, the first thing you lose, even before your hearing starts to go away at all, is you start to lose some of the nerve connections that take sound and send it up to your brain. Okay. So these are these inner hair cells that I showed you earlier. Okay. And then we've got auditory nerve fibers that connect to it. And there's something called a synapse. And a synapse is just basically a connection from one cell fiber to another. So this is kind of how we transmit information from this cell to the cell body that's going to be right here, is from these synapses. And what we've learned, this is some great work from Sharon Kujawa and Charlie Lieberman at Harvard Mass Eye and Ear, and work that we are following up on here at Stanford, is when you have lots of noise exposure, for example, these synapses start to die off. Okay? And as these synapses die, then that causes the, hair, the, the nerve fibers to die. This happens before you start to lose your hearing. Okay? So we can have people walking in with perfectly normal audiograms, you know, who actually have some, for, some part of nerve loss. And this is one of the reasons why we think many people have trouble understanding speech in the presence of background noise. We are literally not transmitting as much information to the brain as before, even if I make that sound loud enough. Okay? So this is something, that, this is a, one of the new developments that's really happened the last five years. It's really kind of shaped how a lot of people think about the field and what we can do. And the more hearing loss you have, the more of these nerve fibers die off. Does anyone here have a cochlear implant or know someone who wears a cochlear implant? A couple of you do. This is one of the reasons the amount of nerve fibers left um, is why we think that some patients with cochlear implants do better than others. Okay. A cochlear implant, is, this is a set of electrodes that we can surgically implant in someone who has little to no hearing left. And these electrodes will electrically stimulate your hearing nerve in response to sound. And in this way, you could be completely deaf, but you can hear again. Okay. But the thing, it's, it's, it's a remarkable process. But the thing is with implants, you know, some people do great, and some people have a lot of trouble. And what we theorize is that part of the reason why some people have trouble is they don't have as many nerve fibers left. So one of the challenges for us going forward as a field is how do we identify hearing loss issues versus nerve loss issues? So that's one thing we're working on. So there's examples of work. This is work done here at Stanford. This is something we're expressly exploring. So all these little pink dots right here represent different synapses. And then we've got like you know, the nerve fibers right here. So this is an animal. This is a nice, healthy animal. You take that same animal. You blast it with some noise for an extended period of time. And then suddenly you notice there's a lot less pink dots right here. It's a sign that these synapses are dying off. Okay? And we think that this is part of the reason why people have trouble in background noise, even if you make the sound loud enough. Okay? So what else happens? Well, as I said, you don't just lose your ability to hear soft sounds. Here's another tricky thing that happens. Is you lose your ability to tell small differences in pitch between sounds or timing. And in fact, you get a muddier signal to the brain when you start to lose your hearing. And that's true even if you make that sound loud enough. Okay? 
And this doesn't really matter so much in quiet. Quiet doesn't matter. But in background noise, it's a lot trickier. So what do I mean by this here? Well, OK, so you take a, a you know, remember when I said your ear is like a frequency analyzer? What that really means is basically it's kind of like, we, it's almost like there's a little filter for each frequency. So imagine each one of these bumps corresponds to a different pitch. So we got like beep and beep. And each one of these corresponds to a different pitch. And if you've got a normally functioning ear, you probably have about 15,000 of those. OK, it's pretty remarkable. A normal hearing ear, if you have a really highly trained listener, can tell the difference between a 1,000 hertz tone and a 1,001 hertz tone. Okay. It's, it's uncanny how accurate some people can be. If you want to tell a difference in microseconds between ears, some people could tell like a three microsecond difference between ears. And you hear that as a change in sound location. So in this case here, you know, we've got different filters for different pitches. And that's great. And this is how we hear different pitch. Okay. So one way to think about this, and the way scientists like me think about, and we've actually investigated this, say, well, look, what's the width of those filters? Because if you've got a narrow filter, I can get very small differences between pitch. But if I've got a broad filter, everything starts to kind of smear together. So if you imagine, like, if you're kind of trying to listen for a tone, you want, like, a narrow filter because you can only pick up this one. But if you've got a broader, they've got lots of tones that might fall in there. And you know what happens when we get older? Filters get broader. And this is one of the reasons why we think when we, people get older, why they, have, they say, you know, I have more trouble hearing a background noise than I did before. And part of the reason is because these filters, just the way we physically hear the sound, almost independent of your hearing, it's actually getting worse. So this is the filter shape that we can make. And, and we record these filter shapes. It's, it's the, 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 the most, um, most basic stuff in the world. I ask you to detect a tone. Like, tell me when you hear, raise your hand when you hear the beep and I put some background noise in there. And then I just vary the shape of that noise. And it's, you know, it takes, this takes me, to, if I do this really sophisticated, it takes me 30 minutes or so, but I can get a gorgeous shape of your filter. And if you're young and you got normal hearing, you get a nice filter like this. If you're older and have pretty good hearing, that filter's still broader, okay? So again, you know, just by virtue, this is one of the reasons why as we get older, we have more trouble hearing and background noise. We have broader filters. It's just a messier signal. And you put hearing loss on top of it, and that game gets changes entirely. So again, here, this is like a normal filter width right here. And this is what happens when you get a lot of hearing loss. Suddenly, this gets much broader. So when you have hearing loss, in effect, whatever signal you're sending to the brain is automatically distorted, or it's a little messier than what happens if you have perfectly normal hearing. Okay. So again, so you know, what I tell people is when you lose your ability, when you start to lose your hearing, you don't just lose your ability to hear these soft sounds. There's all these other subtle things that are happening. We have less information going to the brain because of those nerve fibers. The quality of information you're getting isn't quite as good as it used to be. And some of that is just because we get older. Okay. So what about hearing aids? Hearing aids can fix the audibility problem. Okay. We, we, we can do that. But hearing aids can't necessarily fix the transmission problem. And this is a known issue in the field. So when you see people, how many of you wear hearing aids? A number of you? So when people say, you know, like, you know, my hearing aids, they help, but they're not perfect, this is why. Okay? Your ear is a nonlinear system. It's not like with eyeglasses, where if I just change how the light reflects, then it suddenly is perfect again. Because your ear is nonlinear, these other things that kind of go into it, you know, these, these other issues, the transmission issues. You know, kind of the what, what's the quality of the signal you're getting? And trust me when I say the people that made the hearing aid manufacturers and scientists like me are acutely aware of these issues. And we know we can't necessarily fix it, like, within the hearing aid itself. I mean, your ear is your ear. You know, we can't, like, I can't magically restore the nerve fibers yet. Okay? Yet. All right. But, so what we end up doing with hearing aids is we try to come up with other solutions, you know. Um, we, if we change the shape of the microphone characteristics, we improve something what's called the signal to noise ratio. And this right here, what I would think when people say I have a hearing problem, what people are, a, are saying to me most of the time is I have a signal to noise ratio problem. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay. So imagine that you are trying to detect this red dot. Okay. And if there's just this red dot and there's nothing else here, it's pretty easy for you to say where that red dot is. This is kind of the equivalent of trying to say, I want to listen to you, and we're in a nice, quiet room, and there's nobody else around. Okay, there's no distractions, and it's pretty easy to understand what I'm saying. 
So what happens is we add more dots, and more dots a different color, and then we get lots of different dots that kind of jam on top of this. So suddenly, our signal, and we, as we add more noise, it's a lot harder to see this red dot, isn't it? Okay. This is the sort of thing that we experience every single day in noisy environments. Okay. The signal is like if you want to listen to my voice, and all this other stuff is all the other background noise in the room. Okay. So we have, now if you have perfectly normal hearing and you're 19 years old, doing this isn't really a problem, okay? If you're 60 years old and your hearing isn't so good, we need a better signal to noise ratio to achieve the same level of speech understanding, okay? So again, people with hearing loss, I like to say, you know, when they say I have trouble understanding speech, what the real issue is, how do I make the sound audible and so that you can hear it? And how do I make it audible at a signal to noise ratio where you can function? And that's the challenge all the time. So with hearing aids, you know, we do this with devices, for example, like microphones that try to um, um, only like amplify what you're looking at. Okay? And there are actually people developing like really high grade um, what we call directional microphones that fit on your eyeglasses, for example. So if I'm looking at you, you know, I'm gonna hear basically that, but I'm not gonna hear anything else. So it's basically look what you want to hear. There are people playing games with noise reduction, with other things, because we have to basically reverse engineer the signal to noise ratio problem. Because we know that we can't necessarily fix it yet. Okay? This is the real issue right here. Okay. Let's go to lightning round. Let's do, this is kind of a general overview. What I'm gonna go to now is what I call this, like basically kind of, or I call this audiology potpourri, where I answer basically questions that people come to me all the time. You know, there are questions, certain questions I get asked all the time. Yes? So the, the question was, what about earbuds where you're listening with phones? Let me come to that. If you wait about, if you wait about 10 minutes, we're going to cover a lot of that, okay? And we can cover that in greater detail. Can I, let, me, let me field questions. I'll tell you what more we're a little bit later. Get, can we field questions a bit later? Is that okay? What's that? Um, I can cover it in the Q&A. I'll cover it in the Q&A. Okay. But instead of Fabio, you get me here today. Okay? <laughs> so, all right. All right, so let's lead with a very important question, something that is a really hot topic right now. Um, probably seen this on, you know, this is like, I think, one of the hot hearing issues of our time. Do you hear Yanni or Laurel? <laughs> All right, how many, how many of you guys have, have listened to this at some point? Okay, what do you, what do you hear? Yeah, so, so we're, we're all split 50-50. You, you guys want to play it now? Yeah. yeah, okay, so let's play it. You tell me what you hear. So we'll take a votes here. Okay, how many heard Yanni? How many heard Laurel? Okay, so we're, okay. so the question is now, of course, people are like, why does this happen, all right? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why it happens. Okay, but first, you know, like, like whoops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, look, so what's going on here? What's going on? Okay, so uh, to, do, to teach you why you hear, some people really hear one thing and some people hear another thing, I gotta teach you how we understand speech, okay? And how we understand speech is basically pattern recognition, okay? So basically, you get used, you have years and decades of listening to speech sounds, and your brain gets used to hearing certain sounds, and we basically develop little patterns inside our head of what speech should sound like, okay? And one of the key parts, the re how we can do that is because different speech sounds have energy in different frequency regions. So you take like a vowel, so you take like ah, or e, or oo, if I plot like frequency and what's the loudness, well, ah has peaks here, here, and here. E has peaks in different places. Oo has peaks here. So you can see that the peaks are different. So every sound has its own individual template or identity. Okay? And what happens when we listen to sound over years and years is, well, I know that this is an ah, and I know that this is an e, and I know that this is an oo. If I get something that's close to it, you know, and I say, okay, well, that's still an ah. And that's what we do all the time. We basically learn to recognize these patterns. Okay, so what happens if you get conflicting information? What happens is people, if you only hear part of a sound, you te we tend to weigh certain parts of the speech sound more, and they just try to find the closest pattern that matches it. Okay, and so basically that's what we do. We pick the pattern closest to what we're hearing. 
And individuals have different listening strategies almost. And that's based in part on what you hear, okay? So what's going on here with the Laurel or the Yanni thing? Well, so there's a few things going on here. Um, one, this is, a, this is a distorted signal. And they're intentionally doing this because if they make a cleaner signal, it suddenly starts, gets easier to tease out. Now this is something called a spectrogram, which is basically a way of plotting energy in speech sounds. So I've got time over here on this axis. And I've got frequency here, and you can estimate intensity by how red is it, okay? So in this case, you know, um, remember those formants that I showed you back here? Like this. So normally sounds would have three different formants. And what we look for, so we've got a nice formant right here. So formant would be like a nice line in this. We've got one, and I've got three. The second one isn't really there, okay? So what they've done with this, they've done a few different things. I could tell you, they've taken this signal, they've shifted the initial frequency to be halfway between R or between Y and L, and they basically stripped out the second formant. Okay? So you put those two things together, but suddenly you've created an ambiguous signal. And when your brain gets ambiguity, what it does is it picks the closest pattern and says, that's what I hear. And that's why some of you hear Yanni and some of you hear Laurel. And that's why it changes sometimes depending on are you listening off a good speaker, are you listening off headphones, what happens if you use the little slider. Because all you're doing there is adjusting the information that you're getting to your brain. And again, once you pick up on different parts, then we, that's, we pick the closest template. And that's what we do. And kind of consistent with that view here, um, I'll skip past this here one more time. We actually, this is, um, um, you know, if you're um, a smart guy like me, your goal in life is to marry a smarter woman. So, <laughs> so in this case, so this is my wife. This is Dr. Gabriela Musakia. She's a neuroscientist and a um, professor at the University of the Pacific, where she teaches basic science classes to the audiologists, budding audiologists there. And she also has a, a small research appointment at Stanford. But what she did is so she recorded brain activity to, in one of her students who could hear Laurel or Yanni kind of almost at will. And so when they are hearing, and what this is measuring is like how much is your brain responding to different frequencies? So remember when I said basically kind of depending on what we're listening to, whether subconsciously or not. So when this person is hearing Laurel, we get more energy here. And when they hear Yanni, they get more energy here. Okay? So this is what we do. We basically, we lock in on certain parts of a sound and just get our best template. And I can tell you that sometimes with hearing loss, people start adopting bad strategies. And that's another reason why people can have trouble in background noise. Because with hearing loss, you can get incomplete information, so people start adopting bad strategies, and they pick a wrong template. Okay, let's go next topic, kids and their music, okay? Everybody, how many of you have dealt with or seen children listening to stuff that's like, why on earth are you listening to music that loud on your headphones? Anybody ever seen that? Okay, yeah, this, is, this happens over and over and over again, and you talk to parents, you know, and then they start feeling like grumpy Grandpa Simpson saying, get off my lawn, and please, you know, turn that down, you know? And you ask your kid to turn it down, and they look at you, and they say, never. <laughs> We're not turning that sound down at all, you know. And this causes us to get all wound up, you know. As we have these issues over and over, we're fighting like this, and what you really want to know is, so is my kid going to go deaf or what? Okay, you know. So, and the short answer with this, again, of course, as with anything, it's complicated. Um, they're not going to go deaf right off the bat, but you increase the likelihood they're going to have a problem down the road. And what I'm really going to tell you here is there is some evidence to suggest that the rate of hearing loss is increasing in teenagers, okay? But showing a direct cause, say, between listening to loud music over your headphones, it's a little equivocal, okay? It's a reasonable assumption. We, can't, we, we have not demonstrated we've proven that yet. So let me sh give you an example here. So this is a, a study. I, I, I kind of like this one because, you know, this is a, a group of foster kids in New York City. Okay, I mean, but, but with, with these kids, when they're in the system, they have a chance to get consistent health information over time. So they've got over 23 years worth of data right here on hearing thresholds in these kids. And you know, New York City, it's a noisy place. These kids ride the subway, you know. And so we have a certain, you know, 10% of them have some degree of high frequency hearing loss. And then around 2005 or six, this starts to go up. And that's right around the time that iPods really started taking hold. So this sort of thing makes you say, well, okay, this is a, um, you know, this, this would be one clear, it's, it's correlative, you know, that, you know, kids are more likely to develop hearing loss from listening to loud music. But here's a paper that just came out earlier this year that I liked where they actually measured it. They said, okay, let's take a group of college kids, 
let's have them listen to the music player, whatever volume they want. Let's record what that volume is. And then we're going to compare that to all sorts of different hearing measures. And you know what? It didn't matter what level they were listening. We didn't see any change. Okay, so there's a, a and this is short-term and long-term changes. So there's a, so this is what I say, the data are a little equivocal. There's reason to think. We know that loud noise causes hearing loss. We know there's more exposure to loud noise than there used to be before, okay, or more opportunities to do that. But we have not, I, I haven't seen a lot of good hard data that say if you listen to this, you know, you know that this is what's going to do it. Okay, it's a reasonable assumption. I think it's probably right. But every time people look at these direct studies, the data are a little loose. Okay. Now here's something to keep in mind though. Kids do listen to music more loudly than adults do. But that goes back to signal to noise ratio. Kids actually to understand speech need a better signal to noise ratio than adults do. Selective attention is developing. Okay, it starts at about six years of age and continues all the way through into your early 20s. And a lot of studies have shown that like, the adults, the preferred signal to noise ratio for adults when they're listening to music is about 13 dB. And kids like it about 20. Okay? So part of the reason why kids' volume goes up is because they just want a better SNR. They want to knock out the noise. And you know who the noise is? <laughs> Us. <laughs> of course, you know, whoops, let me go back. Um, where you listen to music is going to matter. You know, I cannot count the number of times when I was living in New York City where I'd see kids on the subway. Um, you know, with blasting it over the subway, and that's tough. You know, if you're, you know, some of the data again, ethnic minorities tend to listen to louder levels. But is that related to the environment in which they're in? That's harder to say. Okay, so there's a lot of issues at play here, but I think this is a big one right here. You know, it's like you kids listen, need a higher signal noise ratio, and that's part, I think that's a bigger reason why they listen to it louder. Okay, so how to reduce the likelihood that I'm going to lose my hearing? One for the, I recommend to people is get a better set of hear, or earbuds. If you're dealing with kids, and here's the reason why. Because if we need a better signal to noise ratio, which is what most of these kids are looking for, and adults, if you have these like, you know, the little earbuds that come from Apple, you know, these things don't really fit in your ear. The sound quality on these things is really bad, you know, and they don't have much bass. So most people are trying to get enough bass to really kind of enjoy their music. So if you've got some background noise and you have something that isn't fitting properly where sound is leaking out, so they're going to keep cranking it up and cranking it up and cranking it up to try and get the SNR on the bass they want. So an easy way to fix this, just get a better set of headphones. Honestly, that goes so, it's amazing how you, you don't have to crank up the volume as much if you get a better set of headphones. Okay? And that kind of goes directly to your question right there. The, um, measure how loud things are. Your iPhone or your Android phone are surprisingly accurate at this. Stanford published a paper a couple years ago. They measured levels in movie theaters, and their iPhone was within one dB of like something we spent twenty thousand dollars on, you know. Which is uh, um, so. There's like the, my favorite. There's a ton of apps out there. My favorite. Um, this is by basically made by the same people that do occupational safety health standards. You know, this is a good high quality sound um, sound level meter. There's also things like you know um, this website from the World Health Organization, IHearYou.co. And it's basically kind of helps people to report the sound levels of different restaurants that they're in. So if you want to identify places that's a little quieter and easier to understand, then this is some place you can go. Okay? So these are great things, to, I think, for people to do and to be looking at. Wear ear protection. And not only that, but I think musicians' plugs. You know, if you have a child or grandchild or somebody who's a musician, you know, getting a good set of musicians' plugs is a lifesaver. Because we know that musicians are at greater risk for hearing loss. And the advantage of a good set of musicians' plugs is they attenuate sound equally at all frequencies. And a lot of people don't like to wear earplugs because your classic like little foam yellow earplug that you shove in your ear is very good at knocking down high frequency sounds and not so good at knocking down low frequency sounds. So now things sound different. And when people sound different, if you want clarity in your music, well, I don't want that. So they take it out. And then you're getting loud noise again. A good set of musicians' plugs will attenuate all sounds equally. So that means you can wear it consistently and for longer and protect your hearing. Okay? What if I have a little bit of hearing loss? Do I got to do anything? Okay? I get asked this a lot. I mean, first, any child with even a small amount of hearing loss, even borderline normal hearing, it is, you have to take that very seriously. Remember I showed you those shapes of speech? You know, kids don't have those representations of speech developed in their brain yet. They have to learn to develop that. And the only way they develop that is by good hearing. 
Okay? So levels of hearing loss that are fine for adults are problematic for kids. Okay? And I always stress, you know, even making sure that things are well-fit hearing aids are absolutely crucial in this population. So what about adults? Okay? For very mild losses, I mean, honestly, the biggest predictor is how much trouble are you having? You know, one of the tricky parts is I can't make, you know, I'm not making anybody wear hearing aids. People come to me if you need help, and we can help you. But, you know, the, the, the issue here is what the perceived communication difficulty is the best predictor of who needs help or not. So that's for a little bit of hearing loss, okay? You know, well, what if I got a little more hearing loss than that? I mean, do I really have to do anything? I mean, I can get by, right? People just speak up. You know, I think we all experience this at some point or have had family members that do this. And say, well, that works to a point, but there's always a cost. Like anything in life, there's always compromises, there's always a cost, okay? Um, there's economic cost to the country. Some people estimate a minimum of 1.8 billion to as, as high as in the hundreds of billions from economic costs from hearing loss. It has been done known for decades that increasing isolation and depression with hearing loss, okay? But this is new. This is in the last couple of years, and this is scaring a lot of people, okay? Increased risk of dementia. So basically, here, we're plotting hearing loss as a, the likelihood of dementia, and with untreated hearing loss, the likelihood of dementia goes up tremendously, okay? So hearing, it's, it's not the sort of thing we say, well, I'll just get by. Okay, but there's a cost to that because the likelihood of having problems in other facets of your life go up tremendously. And here they're actually plotting like brain matter. Okay, and so what you can see is that people with untreated hearing loss relative to brains with normal hearing, the same age, or people who are hearing aids, we started losing brain matter at an earlier age. Okay, so this is a big deal. You know, untreated hearing loss matters. It's not just, you know, well, I can't hear what you're saying. It's that your brain actually changes when you're deprived of the sound input. And the question, of course, is why? And we're not sure yet, you know, but um, isolation may be one part of it. We know when people don't interact with other people that they, the likelihood of, of dementia and other things goes up. So that might be one issue. Another part is just some sort of cognitive overload. If you're working so hard to listen all the time, you know, same way like if you, you like overwork your shoulder or overwork your knee or something like that, maybe we're overworking our brain the same way. Hearing aids, there's brand new papers come out early this year to suggest that hearing aid use can stop that decline. Okay, so it's another thing to think about here. You know, and this is why people say, well, maybe I can get along. Hearing, you know, I mean, this is a, it matters. And hearing aid use matters. Okay, so now I've scared you to death. <laughs> That's good, we, you know, we're, we're scared, you know. So what do we do at this point? So again, you know, you can monitor your hearing. Uh, clearly, you can come see a big nerd like me. I love helping people out, you know. There's also even like apps. My favorite app is one that's coming out later this summer. It's called Hear Screen USA. Um, this, there, I can tell you there's a ton of apps to test hearing. There's more science backing this one up probably than the rest of the apps put together. And this one, they're getting it set up to actually will it basically predict if you got a moderate or worse loss, and then actually direct you to, nearby, you to a nearby audiologist, okay? So this comes out later this year, but I think this is the way to go. Okay, ear protection, I think is great. I think it's crucial. You've heard me kind of mention this before. Get help from people like me. You know, we can do this as well. I got a great team of people. These are just my adult audiologists, but um, okay. But what if you're still scared? <laughs> and sometimes fear turns into anger, you know, so we can be an angry possum like this. One of my lab members loves possums and sends possum photos every once. So I promise I'd probably put that in. But so, so when that happens, you know, you could be like, well, look, so what's Stanford gonna do about this? Okay, we, do, we don't have to get the pitchforks and torches out. I can tell you we're on this, you know. And so we have a lot of research going in at this, okay. Some of this is very basic science stuff. And some of this is what we call translational. We're trying to take things and put it into basic science. Now we have a ton of things going on, but I'm gonna show you with you guys like two what I call moonshots, okay. And moonshots are a big deal. Like what do I mean by moonshot? Moonshots are designed to solve big problems, radical solutions, and with potentially feasible technology. So take my world in audiology. What's a moonshot? What if I change the whole test battery? Okay, and we say, why do I want to do that? Well, the fact is the test battery for audiology hasn't changed in 70 years. We come in, we ask you to raise your hand or press a button when you hear the beeps, and then we ask you to repeat words in quiet. Okay, so you think about it. what makes people come in. They say, I have trouble hearing a noise. And I say, great, say the word bass. 
Okay? So there's a huge disconnect between what people say their problem is and what we're actually doing on a clinical basis. So I can tell you that here at Stanford, the last couple of years, we have, um, we're trying to make speech in noise the default test of speech perception in the basic audiogram. And I tell you, I've got, the, I've got data on about over 4,000 adults. Um, I'll skip past a lot of this. I think I'll show you this one because I think this is important. This is your ability to understand speech and noise. This is your ability to understand speech and quiet. Okay? Anything this line to the left is normal speech and noise. So what you can see, I got a ton of people here, thousands of people who can have no problems at all in quiet, who cannot function in background noise. That's exactly the sort of complaints people have every single day, and it's exactly the sort of thing that basic hearing tests have missed for 50, 60, 70 years. So we are, um, in effect, creating new guidelines. Um, I'll skip past this stuff. Um, to say, in effect, we have, we're creating new guidelines for testing. Because basically, by taking a look at what the speech noise in the hearing test is, I can pretty much predict if you're going to do fine and quiet or not. Okay? So we're getting these published, and we are, I've been speaking on this all over the US. We are literally trying to fundamentally change how hearing testing is done. I think we've got the goods. I do. So here's another thing. So let's take our basic science end. What's a moonshot there? What if we just cured hearing loss altogether? I mean, I mean it, it sounds audacious, but, but the, I mean, really, that would, that would solve basically the whole issue. I mean, and so here at Stanford, we've got, um, there's four key areas that we're working on here, okay? So one of these looking at stem cell therapy, okay? Then we hear the concept of stem cells all the time, you know? How do we take cells? Can we basically regrow those cells that you lose, okay? So we're working on that. I mean, one of the core challenges right now is that the, um, we're very good at using stem cells to regrow hearing before the animal's auditory system has matured. After it's matured, it's a lot harder, okay? So we are very, so it's trying to figure out, well, you know, how do we basically take the adult system and make it think it's a juvenile system? And that's kind of where the real issue is going on right now. Here's another thing we do, gene therapy. Most forms of hearing loss, you know, are caused by basic, basically deficits in three genes, okay? And I don't know if you guys know, the, 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 the amount of gene therapy or gene editing that's going on today is tremendous. The whole CRISPR thing. Bill Gates has said repeatedly, he said, you know, if I was a kid today, I wouldn't be trying to hack computers. I'd be trying to hack biology. Because really, you can create new things that are out there. I think this is, this is a, so the question is, you know, can we modify the genes associated with hearing loss and effect eliminate it? Molecular therapy. I mean, we know, for example, certain medications will cause hearing loss. But if you need it, you gotta take it, okay? Chemotherapy, things like this. What if we can basically develop novel drugs that'll protect, preserve hearing, okay? We have, hard, we have people working hard on this. And then there's also, you know, I've talked to you about like, how do we stimulate the hearing nerve? You know, we've talked about the normal transmission. If we are getting less information than before, okay, we're looking at new ways to stimulate your hearing nerve and this way to kind of maximize it. So we've got a great team of people here in this regard working on this. and. Um, um, so here's another question I get. Well, look, since you're going to cure hearing loss, I don't have to do anything, right? Just wait five years, you know? So let me put it like this. We are great at, cage, at, at regenerating your hearing if you're a baby chicken. But you are not baby chickens, OK? So if you're a baby chicken, you're cool. We can, we can help you out. But since you're not baby chickens, I, you know, there, there's no need to wait. And again, um, there's, there's a lot of things that are coming down the pipe. You know. You know, hearing aids are going to be available over the counter. It's going to get a lot cheaper, okay? There's opportunities for help. Your iPhone may become your hearing aid. There's advantages and disadvantages to all these. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, we may integrate hearing aids with other parts. You know, like if we want to monitor your temperature, pulse rate, other things, I mean, think about it. You have a device in your ear. It's attached to your body. The whole, the ra whole range of things that we could do. So there may be some greater integration along those lines. There's a lot of things coming down the pipe. There's no need to really wait. And so I'd say, you know, um, we are here to help. You know? And so if you have questions or problems, and we can help on, on virtually almost every area. So I think I'll stop now. We'll kick it to questions. So, so we'll start here, and then I'll just jump around. So yes? Okay. Out of all the disabilities that people have in hearing, there's not something that people get. They do looping. Right, after the fact. fact, right. So the question is about ADA issues and how many buildings um, 
are not really set up for, okay, perfect, how many buildings are not really set up to accommodate people with hearing loss? And so they'll come up with solutions after the fact. I mean, you're right. I mean, the fact is, I mean, to be blunt, the acoustics in so many buildings are horrible. And if you're in an older building, they're bad. You know, you, you go to your average new restaurant these days, and you notice they all have high ceilings and hard surfaces everywhere, okay? When you do that, sound echoes. And businesses do that for two reasons. It's an intentional design choice. The first is so that when you're walking by on the street, you think, gosh, that's a noisy place. It's pretty exciting. We should go check it out. <laughs> and, then, and then you eat dinner, you know, you finish eating dinner, you're like, gosh, I can't hear a darn thing you're saying. Let's get out of here. <laughs> So it gets people in and out the door, but so this is a, I, in my opinion, I, I really feel like um, there has to be a change in how we think about this. I can tell you that a lot of new buildings, people are paying much more attention to this. The question is how do we retrofit old buildings? But you're spot on, this is a known issue and it's a big concern. Let's cook it to it. Let's go over there and then we'll go. Yeah, we have mics. Yeah. Um, thank you. I uh, was concerned about two causes of, other causes of hearing loss. Um, could you, um, speak if there are any communicable diseases that lead, um, oftentimes can, untreated can lead to, to hearing loss or hearing damage. And then also, um, does our cardiovascular health, any of those things like blood pressure affect our hearing? The, the relationships there are most, so the question had, to, did, did anyone get the question? No. Okay, so the, the, the question had to do with, uh, are there other forms of communicable diseases that result in <coughs> hearing loss? You know, things we need, and particularly cardiovascular issues. What I would say, the relationship there tends to be indirect, okay? We know that diabetes is associated with hearing loss. Some of that has to do with actually some of the membrane structures in the kidney are actually similar to that of the ear. So the diseases that tend to affect one tend to affect the other. But you know, there, there's a, so, but a lot of cases, whether with cardiovascular or otherwise, um, there's associative relationships, but not necessarily direct. So people that exercise regularly tend to have better hearing. The question is, well, does the exercise, for example, make your hearing better, you know? Or is it more of an issue of like, people who exercise regularly tend to be healthier in all facets of their life? So I think the question is, how do we disentangle that? There are things like this, but on the whole, those issues tend to be much less effects of noise exposure, genetic deafness, and, and certain drug exposures. Let's go over here. Like, we'll go to this gentleman right here in the back. Let's, oh, okay, well, this question right there, perfect. I get... MRIs done every four months. Is there anything that will plug my ears so I don't hear too much of the bzz, bzz. Yeah, we can reduce the intensity through ear. Do you wear ear protection when you're in the MRIs? The, the normal that they put in my ear, yes, but that doesn't seem so, to do anything. So what, I, what I would say, my response to that is a custom set of earplugs will knock out a lot more. The, the, your average like yellow foam plugs that you get somebody's ear, well, depending upon how tightly you get it to sit, will knock anywhere between six and 15 out, six to 15 dB out. You can get earplugs, uh, custom earplugs that will knock out uh, an excess in 25 to 35. So in my case, in a situation like this where you know you're going to be in repeated situations and you're worried about it, get a custom set. It's easy to do, it doesn't take much time at all. You know, we have a lot of exposure with that, so. Where? And the answer is where our clinic will do it easily. So, anywhere. <laughs> Just give somebody a mic and then let's go. <laughs> Hello. Uh, is there something like a, a lazy ear, just like you have a lazy eye, where if you have a slight uh, hearing disability, then uh, you kind of get dependent on the hearing aid and it causes it to be worse? Short answer is I don't think so, no. Oddly enough, what happens, you know, there's data out there to suggest that if you do not wear hearing aids, your ability to understand speech in that unaided ear can get worse, okay? And there's old data out there, it's not a big effect, but it does exist. And we see this with cochlear implant patients that don't stop wearing the hearing aid in the other ear, where often their ability to understand speech so the bigger issue is lack of auditory input is far more likely to cause a problem than, say, becoming dependent on the aid. Okay. Anyone? Anywhere? Right here. Is there any uh, training programs that you can uh, kind of, you know, like like playing games or something to train to to prevent the deterioration of the hearing? Well. In, in that case, when we talk about deterioration of hearing, there's two issues there. So one, the deterioration of the hearing mechanism itself 
that does not exist. Okay, what the, where the, a lot of the training programs are for people that have trouble understanding speech and noise, how do we facilitate that, and can we help that through different game training things? And there's two schools of thought on this. I mean, I to my mind, I so as a guy that spends a lot of time trying to develop new training programs, I feel like what people we we I don't think people. The scientist Matt says, I mean, clinician Matt says, yes, there are things out there. Scientist Matt says that people haven't always spent a lot of time looking at exactly what people are learning when they do these things. And so when people say, well, which training program is most effective for me, it's almost like, well, what's, what's your problem? I think the training programs that are likely to be most effective tend to focus on identifying the pitch of someone's voice in the presence of background noise and learning to track or follow that pitch. So that's partially hearing mechanism, partially intentional mechanism. I think those sorts of things are likely to yield a bigger bang for the buck, you know, in that case. Hi, I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about tinnitus and um, having that condition on top of other hearing loss. So, so tinnitus or tinnitus, so the, the assumption that what's happening here, or what the prevailing, there's a lot of causes this. And when I say this, we talk about ringing in the ears or the ear producing sound or buzzing or other noises. So my ear, I've had tinnitus for 20 years now. Uh, my ears make a low grade constant whooshing sound like, like a, like a kind of blown out Chevy speaker or something. So <laughs> anyway, so, but, so the, what is happening there or what, what the prevailing theory is, is that something has changed in your ear in most cases. So remember when I talked about like say those nerve fibers start to die off first. So what's happened was when these things start to die off, our brain is getting an altered input. And when your brain is not getting as much input as it used to get, it actually seeks to make up for it. So all cells in your brain have what's called a spontaneous firing rate, which means they're just going to fire automatically no matter what. And when you deprive the brain of sound, for example, those cells that normally get sound start firing more. So what we think is happening with tinnitus in most cases is something has changed inside the ear, whether it's caused to hearing loss or not, but something has changed. Our brain is getting less input than before, and so certain cells start firing to try to make up for it. And then over the time, we hear that is tinnitus. So the first thing, we, when we start talking with tinnitus, you know, with, with patients, you know, I tell, you know, I mean, one, if we can cure hearing loss, we can cure tinnitus. That's the assumption. But the other, but in terms of what people can do on a day-to-day -day basis, I tell people that sound is your best friend. If you have tinnitus and hearing loss, half the patients right off the bat, just by wearing well-fit hearing aids, find their tinnitus less bothersome. Okay? That's, what's that? Oh, if you have tinnitus and hearing loss, half of the people who have tinnitus and hearing loss, this is half, not everyone, but half the people get benefit um, just by wearing hearing aids. And that's the assumption is because we're adding more sound into their existence. Now, for those people that don't get benefit from that, what, I, what we always recommend with patients is how we teach people how to use sound in your everyday life. Because as we add sound, you know, in effect, we're restoring a more normal pattern or neural activity to the brain. Okay? And therefore, the key is to kind of teaching people how to use sound in different situations depending on what their goal is. So, whether it's where we're trying to help people sleep, so what sorts of sounds help to soothe and to relax. And again, we're not trying to mask the tinnitus, we're not trying to, to we can't make it go away, but what, the goal is to try and use sound to get us in a state, we get a little more normal pattern neural activity to get us in a state where we can do what we want to do, and whether that's concentrate, whether that's sleep. I think we can take one more question here. Um, I have a microphone here. here. Okay. Um, I'm concerned about the very high levels of um, music that are played at the YMCA and at gyms for exercise classes. Um, at what decibel level is it doing damage? Yeah. So that in that case, you know, the OSHA, the, the Occupational Safety Health Administration has guidelines. So it depends on what the levels there are. Where, what it, when you say what levels cause damage, the real question, the real question is, what levels for how long? So if you're listening, say, at about 95 dB, they recommend no more than two to three hours. If you're the, the sound levels are about 110 dB SPL, they recommend no more than about 15 minutes. And so what I would do is I would use your smartphone. I'd get a measurement, you know, and, and based on that, you could either get them to turn it down or get a set of earplugs that you use in, those, um, use in that situation. But you're right, that sort of occupational thing, you know, this is, our world is getting noisier. 
And I think it's a matter of um, either educating the YMCA or other institutions, or in our case, taking our ear protection in our own hands and wearing a set of earplugs as we do it. I think they're gonna, they're gonna I, I'm, happy to I'm happy to answer questions outside. I'll tell you what, we can do that, okay?